That said, though, there are some facts which kind of fundamentally change the entire framework. And Amy, you found something this week which kind of leads into that. Um, remind me. <laughs> the book. Sorry. Oh, it is the book. Sorry, I thought we were talking about that next yet, but I wasn't sure. Right, this is um, another post by uh, Ken Parrott, who writes Open Parachute. And this is about a book called The Day We Found the Universe by Mar uh, Marcia Bartusiak. I'm hoping I... Fantastic title. <laughs> I love that. It's just it's gorgeous. gorgeous. Um, I hope I pronounced that, that correctly, Marcia. So uh, Ken does really, really good book book reviews. They're always worth having a look at because he just, you know, he does really think about it and he, and he sets down what he likes about it. But um, what, what the book does is it describes the work and, and the people and the stories who produced our modern day understanding of the universe. So less than a century even ago, it's, it's not so long ago, we used to think that our, our galaxy, um, otherwise known as the Milky Way, was the entire universe. And we also thought that it was static. Nowadays, of course, we know better. We know that, it's, uh, that the universe is, well, he says infinitely bigger. I'm going to say not quite infinitely bigger, but very, very much bigger. It's got billions of galaxies in ours, and it's expanding, or at least certainly our current understanding of science says that our universe is expanding. And apparently one of the big illusions that the book shatters is the sort of the received wisdom, the received story of how all of this was uh, responsible was the responsibility um, and happened through the work of Edwin Hubble, after whom the Hubble telescope is named. Of course, he, he obviously played a very key role, but there were, and, and this would be standard amongst science uh, stories, really, is there are always going to be a slew of other people involved and other stories and personalities and hiccups and fights and drama and politics and, and the whole shooting match involved in anything like this. So the book um, goes back... And, and actually looks at our history, uh, looks at the history quite a lot as well. For example, Marcia reveals that concepts of a larger universe go back a long way further than certainly I had realized. Um, in fact, even the concept of a multiverse uh, has gone back to, to even in the first century BC, really, the Roman poet and philosopher Lucretius argued against a finite universe. And then over the, over the next, you know, centuries, really, and and it helped get people done in by the Inquisition and burned at the stake. And uh, there were these ideas that our, our, our little spot of life and heat and warmth here may not be the only one, that it's possible that there were, there were countless uh, other heavens or universes or, or however it was people wanted to put it out there too. Which is quite quite a lovely thing to 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 think about. He, uh, she also talks about people like Henrietta Leavitt, um, who discovered the means to measure the the dimensions of the cosmos. Uh, this is during a time when women were allowed in astronomy, sort of in secondary roles as, as computers, which I think is ironic. Um, they did the repetitive calculations and recording from plates, but they weren't allowed to observe. And goes into he goes uh, sorry she rather goes into a number of other uh, wonderful stories as well which are really really worth looking into I'm certainly wanting to read this book as a result but I did want to I'm hoping we have the time just read out a passage here it's a description of Edwin Hubble because I think it's amazing Alf do we have time for that yeah we definitely have cool. time this passage is completely worth it cool so she also seems to have been very good at at describing her characters very colourfully and sort of like warts and all which which you want from a good biographer sort of storyteller and and here is is a description of edwin hubble he was an odd bird but certainly a handsome one friends called him an adonis i think he resembles the british actor jeremy irons raised in missouri in a solid middle class household hubble somewhere along the line yearned to be singular and distinct once he graduated from the university of chicago he went to oxford university as a Rhodes scholar where he completely reinvented himself he adopted a British accent that he maintained for the rest of his life, dressed like a dandy, and began to add dubious credentials to his resume, like saying he once practiced law, which he never did. He married into a rich Los Angeles family and throughout his life seemed intent on erasing his Midwestern roots. His wife never met Hubble's mother or siblings. Hubble was not chums with his astronomy colleagues, but preferred to socialize with the actors and writers in nearby Hollywood. One astronomer called Hubble, often arrogant and standoffish, a stuffed shirt. <laughs> Yes. While Hubble fibbed to his friends about his background, he was meticulously careful about his science. In fact, when he obtained the first evidence in early 1924 that the Andromeda Nebula was truly a distant galaxy, he held off an official report for almost a year. He first wanted to counter every possible argument against his find. Being caught in a scientific error was Hubble's greatest nightmare. And when he did finally release the data at that astronomy meeting on New Year's Day in 1925, after a lot of arm-twisting from his colleagues, he wasn't even there. He had someone else relay the findings. Um, 
so yeah, a, a, a singular, a singular personality by the sounds of it. <laughs> and very, one that's very well captured by the author. Mm, mm. So uh, look, look out for that book. Absolutely, completely changed humanity's understanding of our universe and our place within it. Mm. Not the book, the discovery, <laughs> but <laughs> the book was good too. Indeed. <laughs> um. So my next thing is is somewhat tangentially related, and right now I can't remember the segue. But anyway, <laughs> it's another another post on Cyblogs uh, by our blogger Michael Edmonds, who writes Molecular Matters, and he questions why he answers the question why don't we have a cure for AIDS yet? And so at the moment, uh, Michael notes that the number of people with AIDS is actually going up. Um, now, before people freak out, that's because the people with AIDS are actually surviving rather than dying, which is uh, increasing not the incidence of the uh, of the particular affliction, but rather the longevity of the people within it. And he mentions that he was reading an article about that, and he started to read the comments again and again and again. He gets conspiracy theory, conspiracy theories. Um, basically saying that uh, big pharmaceutical companies want people to survive with AIDS but not cure it so that they can roll in their swimming pools full of money like uh, that cartoon duck, um, Scrooge McDuck. Mm. <laughs> uh, and he goes through and quite systematically notes the difficulties with actually treating HIV, which is the cause for AIDS, and goes some way to explaining why we don't have a cure for HIV yet. And we will go through that, but before we do, I'd just like to point out that while um, it sucks that we don't have a cure for AIDS or for HIV yet, what was, because um, AIDS was first identified in 1983, what was then a complete and utter death sentence, a very, very high mortality rate, is now a treatable condition. Mm. You can live a normal life. You do have to take um, heart therapy. So this is a combination uh, an uh, antiretroviral drugs um, and you have to be on those for your entire life but you can sustain a normal life with HIV and I think that in and of itself uh, is worth a mention even though it's taken us a good 25 years or so to develop that particular technique yeah. we have made huge strides in treating this disease. Indeed um, I recently I, I don't have a citation for this I'll try and look one up for the um, blog post that comes with this podcast but I, I saw somewhere recently that um, in Scandinavia somewhere in, in one of the populations there people who have who are HIV positive and have AIDS now have the same life expectancy as people who don't the drugs have gotten that good Indeed, and there are consistently new ones being developed yeah. and new ways of treating these drugs. Mm. But uh, taking that out of it, um, Michael goes through quickly some of the problems with treating HIV. So the first one he notes is viral reservoirs. So uh, there can be a bunch of different viral reservoirs. A lot of them, when treating general uh, viral infections, can actually be to do with the fact that humans are not always the only host. So for something like rabies, for instance, humans can get infected, dogs can get infected, bats can get infected. So even if you got rid of all the rabies virus in humans, there would still be a viral reservoir in the natural world. Now HIV is not like this. As far as we're aware, there is not a natural reservoir, so one could assume that that would make it easy to treat. The viral reservoir that Michael notes is actually within the human body. So while this is, uh, because this is a retrovirus, it doesn't always have to be active, which means that a lot of the antiretroviral drugs aren't constantly fighting the virus because the virus isn't always replicating. Mm. Uh, so the problem here is that you have to get a drug in sufficient quantities to destroy the virus or to prevent it from replicating in every single cell of the human body. That is an issue and that's a problem, especially when some of these antiretroviral drugs do have significant toxicity of their own. Yeah, there's also the problem of, of uh, most drugs or many drugs are limited to where they can actually reach in the body. So for example, uh, most drugs can't cross the brain blood barrier, so the barrier between the brain and the circulatory system. So even if you got, um, you know, all of all of the virus, uh, all the viruses in the, you know, in the body, in the circulatory system, you may have trouble wiping them out from the brain and vice versa. Mm, absolutely. And things like uh, liposomes, fat deposits, mm. uh, even detecting viruses in body tissue is Tricky. not an easy matter.